Welcome again to the Weekly Scroll. As we continue to navigate the straits, developing news continues to advertise that we are living in very precarious times. And so as we begin uh, in this installment, I felt it was appropriate to read some of Paul's letter written to Timothy so very long ago. So I'm, I'm going to read from 2 Timothy in chapter 3. I'm going to begin at verse 1. And he says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And as far as those types of people, Paul says that you and I are to turn away. He also went on to say that these types of people are likened to the two Egyptian magicians who resisted Moses, these men of corrupt minds who deceived people, including Pharaoh trying to convince them that they possessed some godlike power. Paul went on to say that in the last days, that because of this, people would, quote, turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Of course, fables is to say things that simply are not true, things that are conceived in the wicked imaginations of men. Now, this week, we have seen how that it's very easy for some those who are motivated by lust for power and control and, and who knows what else. How easy it is for these people to just lie and to say things that are just not so. These headstrong, haughty lovers of money and lovers of themselves, they work feverishly to rewrite history and expect that people will believe them instead of their own lying eyes. And sad to say, a lot of times, most of the time, it works. So many people, maybe for their own selfish reasons, they choose to believe a lie at the drop of a hat. Now, in another letter, Paul addresses this, and he reveals that this kind of situation is the result of a strong delusion that God sends upon people because those people would rather believe a lie than to embrace the truth because they did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. As an example of that, in Gay Perry this past week, things got really gay, and the world got a shocking glimpse of what those who take pleasure in unrighteousness think the world should look like. Now, in my view, and I think many of you, this display was an example of the, un of the unholiness that Paul was referring to, that he was warning us about. People without self-control, blaspheming the God of heaven by parading flagrant wickedness before the eyes of the world. Of course, I'm referring specifically to the display that was part of the opening ceremonies in the Olympics in Paris. And I'm sure that most of you have heard about this or you've read about it. Uh, God forbid that you saw it. But anyway, during the opening ceremony, in what appeared to be a, uh, a depiction of the, Lord, uh, the Lord's Supper, or the Last Supper, I should say, drag queens, a transgender model, a naked singer, made to resemble the Greek god Dionysus, or Dionysus. They put on a drag show before the whole world, and all in the name of, and I quote, community tolerance. In fact, among the different torchbearers there at the opening ceremony was a drag queen who, elated at the controversy, said this, and I quote, to the ones that had their feathers ruffled, seeing queerness on their screen, we ain't going nowhere, end quote. It is claimed by some that this was not a depiction of da Vinci's version of the Last Supper, but a depiction of the Feast of Dionysus. And in my view, it doesn't matter whether it was depicting da Vinci's Last Supper or not. The point was this. They wanted to force millions, maybe even billions of people to look upon blatant rebellion and perversion as something that is to be admired, something that is to be celebrated. 
And furthermore, they did this knowing full well that many of those who would be watching would be children. Now, that really shouldn't surprise us, though, seeing that these same kind of people go into American schools and libraries to read inappropriate material to children on so-called drag days. Now, the mainstream media, of course, was thrilled with the display. The AP described it as an unprecedented display of inclusivity. NBC described it as a, quote, unabashed performance. By the way, the word unabashed means having no shame. It was an unabashed performance that, quote, captivated the world. And get this, the First Lady of the United States, Jill Biden, had nothing but praise for the opening ceremonies, calling it spectacular. In fact, she's quoted as saying that the United States would have to work very hard to best Paris opening ceremony when the games are held in 2028 in Los Angeles. She went on to say that, quote, how are we going to top this, end quote. How indeed. Now, on a related note, this past week, the vice president, Kamala Harris, the presumptive Democratic nominee, uh, nominee for president, who, by the way, hails from San Francisco, she appeared with men in drag and uh, certain other LGBTQ plus activists on a popular reality show called Drag Race. And she had this to say in that environment, quote, each day we are seeing our rights and freedoms under attack, including the right of everyone to be who they are, love who they love, openly and with pride. As a footnote to that, other notable poli uh, politicians have appeared on this particular program, including Nancy Pelosi, also from San Francisco, and, of course, the indomitable AOC. But here's the point. Blatant immorality is celebrated and not only celebrated, but it is validated by those who hold positions of power, both in this nation and throughout the world. And in, do, in doing that, they are taking positions that are in direct opposition to the Almighty. Now, in his letter to the Galatians, Paul said this, Do not be deceived. God is it mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. So all of this leads me to this conclusion. If this is where we are headed as a nation, and it certainly seems to be the trend, in some ways, even more so than in Europe and other places, but if this is the trend, we're in big trouble. If this kind of rebellion is embraced, tolerated, validated, and even defended by the people, and especially those who seek high office, then we are opening ourselves up to God's wrath. Now, I know that there are people who will scoff at that last statement, but blowing it off as nothing will not change the reality of the situation. If this kind of rebellion is to be protected by those in government and at the expense of morality as God defines it, my view is we're only a hop, skip, and a jump from What's described in Genesis 19, a culture in which it was dangerous to be outside after dark, lest one be assaulted by men who practice, practice perversity. And of course, we all who read the Bible, we know how that turned out. So that then brings us to the main point of our discussion this week. And it's not really the events that occurred in Paris, but some events that occurred in Washington, D.C., specifically as Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, visited Washington and then addressed Congress. All right, so you might say, what does that have to do with what we have been discussing? Simply this, if we sow rebellion, we will reap the whirlwind. I say that because on the eve of Netanyahu's address, there were about 200 people who described were described by the United States Capitol Police as, quote, peaceful demonstrators invaded the Capitol building. 200. Some of these so-called peaceful protesters forced at least one congressman and his staff to barricade themselves in their offices. These peaceful protesters then began, and I'm quoting, violently beating on all three of the doors. Now see if you can detect the irony in this report compared to some others. Meanwhile, at the Watergate Hotel, where the Israeli prime minister was reported to be staying, quote, 
peaceful demonstrators, end quote, released maggots, crickets, mealworms, and other larvae throughout the hotel in an attempt to disrupt Netanyahu's, as well as the other hotel guests, to disrupt his stay. And ironically, the stated goal of this peaceful protest was to, quote, manufacture chaos so that the Israeli delegation would have, again, I'm quoting, no peace. The most alarming of these demonstrations, however, took place in the streets of Washington, D.C., outside of the Capitol and in Union Square. And I want to read you an excerpt from an article that was published in Time magazine just recently. It said that thousands of protesters with chants of free, free Palestine marched toward the Capitol before some clashed with police and were pepper sprayed. Pro-Palestinian activists who promised a day of rage filled the streets of the nation's capital, many carrying Palestinian flags and signs calling for an end to U.S. aid to Israel and to arrest Netanyahu. Outside the fenced-off capital, the scene was most tense at Washington's Union Station as pro-Palestinian and pro-Hamas demonstrators removed American flags and hoisted Palestinian ones in their place. At one point, an American flag was set on fire alongside an effigy of Netanyahu, prompting cheers from the crowd. Protesters also spray-painted graffiti on a monument to Christopher Columbus and an adjacent Liberty Bell replica, including the words, Hamas is coming. There was one news reporter who was there, and she described this scene as one, as something you might see in the streets of Tehran or another third world city, but it wasn't. It was in the nation's capital. So I want you to think about that. Our capital, the nation's capital, there in the streets, supporters of Hamas, this terrorist organization, were burning American flags and replacing our flag with that of the mythical state of Palestine. In our nation's capital, people were carrying Hamas banners and crying for the destruction of Israel and of America. They even chased some counter-protesters, threatening them to the point that one man had to run into a building and plead for someone to lock the doors behind him so that he wouldn't be hurt. Now, there's another troubling component of this. As far as as the address itself, when Netanyahu was in Congress speaking to them, over 100 congressmen and women, all of them Democrats, decided to skip the message entirely. And why? To show their disdain for Netanyahu, to protest what they believe is Israeli apartheid. But I would suggest that it was also a show of solidarity with the anarchists who were at that moment in the streets, preaching violence and Israel's destruction. We should also take note of the fact that the vice president, who functions as the president of the Senate, decided not to attend, opting instead to speak at a sorority function in Indiana. And it should be further noted that the vice president has uh, was very strangely slow to respond to the protest. She eventually did But it seems to me she took her time. And for the record, the vice president has in times past voiced her support for similar protests, even those that turn to rioting. So when she returns to Washington, D.C., she met briefly with Benjamin Netanyahu and, according to the reports, pressed him to reach a ceasefire agreement with Hamas. However, interestingly, she had no comment when asked if she was going to press Hamas to do the same. Of course, we know that there are many others in her party who consider Netanyahu a war criminal. One of them made that very well known. They view Israel as an apartheid state and Hamas and the people in Gaza as victims of of an oppressive state called Israel. And by the way, some of the most active and outspoken Anti-Israel groups are backed financially by some of the largest donors to the current administration. So what am I getting at? Am I getting into politics? No, that's not the point today. Here's what we're getting at. Hamas is coming. And it's coming to destroy, 
to consume and to devour. And it seems to me that there are many people who are either indifferent to this or worse, they're encouraging it. I'd go so far as to say that there are some in positions of power who are sympathetic to Hamas, whether consciously or unwittingly. The point is this, our attitudes and our actions that are in opposition to God's standards have opened the door to an invasion, not just of immigrants looking for a better life or handouts or whatever, but an invasion of militants, an invasion of those who seek our destruction. So make no mistake about it. What happened in Washington, D.C. with these protests and demonstrations is connected to what happened in Paris and the rebellion that that display represented. There were, in fact, during these demonstrations in D.C., so-called gays for Gaza. They were among the protesters, which I find quite odd because when you think about it, it's, it's, it's as Netanyahu pointed out. Gays in Gaza would be dead gays in Gaza. They would not be tolerated. But nevertheless, it seems that for the moment anyway, and for a common purpose and goal, these two groups have come together and both hold to the old adage which says, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. In short, both are determined to stand against the people of God, thus fulfilling the prophecy that says, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. As it is written in Psalm 83, beginning in verse 2, your enemies make a tumult and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. I'm convinced that the anti-Israel pro-Hamas protests that took place in Washington, D.C., they are evidence of the lawlessness which is being promoted, which is being celebrated, and being encouraged everywhere we look, whether that be in the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games in Paris or in the lawless laws that continue to permeate our land. Those protests are evidence of those acts of rebellion. And so then, Hamas... And the violence that goes with it is the fruit of what we have sown. Proverbs says in chapter 1, verse 31, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. Now, here's something else I want to bring out to you. In Genesis chapter 6, the Bible describes the world in the days leading up to the flood. And you should know that it's these days that Yeshua points to as being descriptive of how things will be before he returns. But in those days, in Genesis chapter 6, it says that God looked upon the earth and he saw that it was corrupt and filled with violence. The Hebrew word that is translated violence is Hamas. He looked upon the earth, saw that it was corrupt, and that it was filled with Hamas. I don't believe that's a coincidence. In fact, I believe that's God's way of telling us what to expect in the last days if we behave as those in the pre-Diluvian world. If, in other words, we are determined to be thoroughly corrupt, to be brazenly rebellious, then Hamas is our fortune. As far as the Gazan War, Israel may yet defeat Hamas there. But if they do, I guarantee you it's going to pop up somewhere else in the world because the Bible said, and the earth was filled with Hamas. And so then, until the Messiah returns, trying to destroy Hamas and other like-minded groups that aren't necessarily called Hamas, but nonetheless have the same objective, until he returns, trying to put these groups down is going to be like playing whack-a-mole. When it's put down in one place, it's going to pop up in another, and particularly in those places where blatant rebellion is the mindset and the attitude and the deeds of the people. 
And when it shows up in those places, it may not, as I said, take on the name Hamas. It might be called Code Pink. It might be called If Not Now or some other name that defines organizations who have taken up the so-called cause of Hamas. Hamas is most certainly coming to America if we don't take a stand against such rebellion. And to be clear, by taking a stand, I don't mean exclusively in a political way or in a judicial way. Because as as believers, our warfare is not carnal. Our enemies are not flesh and blood. And so by taking a stand, I mean that you and I have to resist the societal trends and the pressure that comes with it and the pressure to acquiesce to the demands of our current culture. We need to stand fast in the truth. We need to repent of our national sins. We need to reject the rebellious deeds that are being celebrated in our cities and unfortunately and apparently in the halls of Congress, in the halls of government, in the White House and other places. We need to take a stand against the perversion and the lawlessness that permeates this world and certainly is working its way through our nation. And so that being said, how do we do that? In the book of Joel, through the prophet, God told the people that an invasion was coming, an invasion that would swarm and that would chew and that would consume and lay waste to everything in its path. And through the prophet, God said that these invaders were going to be allowed to have free reign in the land because God's people had turned their back on the Almighty. And according to this, the prophet Joel, this invasion would be a precursor to the day of the Lord, a day of darkness and gloominess, as it's described, a day unlike anything the world had yet seen. But in that description and in that warning, God did not leave them hopeless. No, he challenged them to fast, to pray, to intercede, and to petition, to petition heaven for mercy. And he tells them this this in Joel chapter 2, verse 12. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. The point. He addresses their sins and their rebellion. He challenges them to repent and to turn from those things because if you don't, here's what's about to happen. There's an invasion. There are people coming into your land to destroy you and to consume everything. In fact, in Joel, it likens them to locusts, things that chew and devour everything that is green and everything that represents life. So then, I think that we should take the warning that was given us seriously. Hamas is coming. And why? Because we have allowed things to go on in this nation that should not be. Rebellious, rebelliousness, all kinds of perverse things. And we, unfortunately, as believers, have kind of sat back and watched it happen. But now we're at the point that there's going to be some consequences I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen next week any more than you do. No one knows really what's going to happen. We do know that times are changing. Things are happening very fast. And we're surprised with each event that develops day by day, week to week. Again, we still don't know what exactly will happen. But we do know that if we do nothing, Hamas is coming. And so we must do now. We we do the things that God has told us to do. We must do what the scripture has challenged us to do and, and to function according to the word of God. Because as Paul said, if we do that, Galatians 6, 8 and 9, he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And so let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And so the point is, similar to what was stated in Joel, yes, these 
horrific and terrifying things are happening. These perverse and blatantly wicked things are happening. But we should not concede, and we should not just give up and just twiddle our thumbs and wait till Jesus comes. No, we should do good. We need to do things that God has prescribed for us to do as a testimony, as a witness, to resist the uh, pervasive wickedness that is going on in this world. And we cannot, in doing good, lose heart. So I will leave you with these thoughts. It may be that Hamas is coming, but for the faithful of God, keep in mind that someone far more powerful than Hamas is coming, and that is Yeshua the Messiah. And when he comes, he will put down all of his enemies. Even so, come Lord Yeshua. Yeshua.